And we are live. Good evening, everyone. My name is Claire. I'm the event coordinator at Village Books in Bellingham and Linden, Washington. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Oh, someone is here from Dallas. Welcome, Dallas, Amy. That's very exciting. We're glad that you could join us tonight. We are up here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, a few things that I want you to know before we get started um, about Crowdcast. If you look in the upper right hand corner of the screen, you will see there is a green follow button. If you click on follow, you'll be able to see all the events that we have coming down the road. We have not let a thing like a pandemic slow down our robust event programming at Village Books that we're known for. So if you click on follow, you'll be able to see everything that we've got coming up. Um, and we are happily, our event programming is largely free currently in our virtual world, but we do appreciate those of you who made a contribution at registration for this event. Uh, we, again, I'm glad that we don't have to charge for events right now, but we do appreciate those of you who kicked in some dollars to, to support the programming here. So thank you very much. And if you didn't, that's fine too. Like I said, we're glad that we can offer it uh, for free. Um, one thing I'm going to let you know about that chat that's on the right hand side of the screen, I am going to go ahead and disable that, but only temporarily. I'm going to disable it just for the duration of the, the, the conversation between our featured guests this evening. And then when it's time for the Q&A, portion of the event, I will bring the chat back up. So we will encourage audience participation through the chat. However, I am certain that through this presentation tonight, you are probably going to have some questions. There is a very easy way to gather questions and kind of hold them until the Q&A portion. If you look at the bottom of your screen, a little bit in the middle, you'll see something that says, ask a question. If you click on ask a question, a little dialog box pops up. You can type in your question. It will keep it there until it's time for the Q&A. So at any time during the presentation this evening, during the conversation, please, please utilize the ask a question feature because our authors do welcome questions from you this evening. So again, if you have a question, just pop it into the ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen and we will be happy to address that um, at the at the Q&A period. Um, I also want to state that the Village Books virtual events, virtual readings gallery is a safe space. Any user exhibiting offensive or inappropriate behavior will be ejected from the event immediately. Another very important button on this screen is this big green one right here, center screen that says purchase facing death here. That is a link directly to the Village Books website and the page where you can find tonight's featured book. Um, we do encourage you to, um, if you're feeling inspired by what you hear tonight uh, and you want to support a, a, a Pacific Northwest author and an independent Pacific Northwest bookstore, we encourage you to um, to click on that link and, and make, a, make a purchase from us. We would appreciate it. Um, I mentioned that we have events coming down the road. There's one just this Thursday night. Uh, we have an event coming up that I want to talk about. It is for a uh, fiction writer. Um, we are pl pleased to welcome Ashley Sweeney back. She wrote the award-winning and best-selling novel, Eliza Waite. She is going to be here on Thursday night to discuss her new book, um, Answer Creek. Ashley is a an amazing historical fiction writer, and we can't wait to, uh, to welcome her on Thursday night. She's going to be in conversation with Julie Christine Johnson, a fellow author. So, um, Again, if you have a question at any time during this evening, please feel free to pop it in that ask a question feature. Okay, and now a little bit about our guest this evening. Our moderator tonight, Greg Shaw, is the founding investor in Clyde Hill Publishing, and he has deep roots in all aspects of publishing, including content development and promotion. He's the author of The Ability Hacks and The Future Computed, AI and Manufacturing. He was CEO and publisher of Seattle's Crosscut News, an independent editorial site that publishes long-term, long-form journalism and eBooks. He is going to be in conversation with our featured author this evening. We are so pleased to welcome Dr. Jim Demain, who spent nearly 40 years caring for severely ill, severely Ill patients. 
and witnessing their final days as a pulmonary and critical care specialist. He was the chief of medical specialties and co-chaired the ethics committee at Group Health Cooperative, which is now Kaiser Permanente. And Dr. Demain is honored to be a clinical professor of medicine emeritus at the University of Washington School of Medicine. His often dramatic experiences with patients near death led him to blog and then to speak about their stories with special attention to the issue of advocacy for patients unable to speak for themselves. He is here to present his book, Facing Death, Finding Dignity, Hope, and Healing at the End. So please join me in welcoming Greg Shaw and Dr. Jim Demain. Great, thank you. Uh, I welcome everyone. Um, we're very excited for this evening. It's an important conversation. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We'd love for this to be uh, very interactive. Uh, I want to get right to uh, Dr. Demain, uh, but first I want to tell you a little story how he and I met. We met uh, across a fence line. We were uh, neighbors. I moved in next door to his family home uh, in 1994, uh, and we've really grown to be close friends. Our families uh, know one another. Uh, they hosted a baby shower for us, and a year later, my mom died, and Jim was really one of the few people who reached out to me, gave me something to read that was, uh, that was very helpful. Uh, so we've been through a lot of uh, life together, uh, so it's, it's my great pleasure to, to have a chance to to speak with him. Uh, you know, I, I started reading his blog uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, he, he as, as you'll see from the book, he's a beautiful writer, uh, very good storyteller, uh, you know, obviously very deep on this subject. And I have this publishing company, Clyde Hill Publishing, and I said, I really think that these could become, uh, you know, a, a book um, and really bring all of that uh, storytelling and advice together. And the result is, uh, is what you have here, uh, facing death and what we'll be uh, talking about this evening. So the, the organization of this is, I'll be monitoring uh, the ask a question button here. Um, I'll come back and ask uh, Jim a few questions while you're contemplating your questions. Uh, and we'll go back and forth until about eight o'clock. I should say for the person in Dallas, welcome. I went to J.J. Pierce High School in Richardson. So we have some fellow Texans here. Uh, without further ado, Jim, uh, welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thanks, Greg, and, uh, and thanks, Village Books. The, uh, what, what, what I'd like to do is, uh, let me turn the volume down here a little bit. I'm, I'm getting echo. Let's see if that's any better. I think I'm going to have to change and put on a headset. While he's doing that, I'll make a little joke that uh, here we are in the backyard of of uh, Microsoft and other tech companies. And of course we <laughs> have, have tech issues, but uh, this was sort of presaged and we're told that these headphones will uh, get rid of that. Are you able to hear us now, Jim, with uh, one of the headphones in? Are you able to hear us? Uh, I'm still getting echo. Oh, well, we, hear, we hear you very well. Can you hear me? No? Yep. Okay. Yeah, just fine. All right. If 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 Jim is hearing an echo, he may have more than one window open in his browser. He should have only one window open, one crowdcast. Okay, is that any better? 
It's it's perfectly fine for us. I think you're well, the only one getting a. For me, I'm not getting echo now, so that must have been a problem. Anyway, thank you very much. I really appreciate people coming. I'm very used to having a live audience, and I'd love to be able to see your faces. Unfortunately, I can't. Uh, everybody comes here for a reason, and I'd love to be able to go around the room and ask you what brings you to a talk like this. And I must admit, I admire you for coming to a talk like this because this is a, a difficult subject and one that we probably don't think about enough. Um, what, what I'd like to do um, to begin with is read a little bit from the book and, and then tell a story um, that is right at the front part of the book and then uh, uh, read you uh, another story about a colleague of mine that passed away. So at the beginning, for 38 years, I cared for very sick, terminally ill patients. Their stories, their deaths and suffering have become part of me. I've collected and treasured the many kind notes that patients and families have sent me, at times that credit, crediting me with powers I do not deserve. As I ministered to patients, their loved ones and caregivers, I was part doctor, part teacher, and part spiritual advisor. In a care conference in the intensive care unit, I would often tell a story to help a family understand the crisis their loved one was enduring. I tend to think in stories and found that through them, families could more easily grasp whatever lesson I was trying to impart. They, like most of us, had not talked much about death and were unprepared for it. But when death lands on our doorstep, do we lock the door or do we welcome it in? Dying is different for each of us as we enter the unknowable on our own unique path. Sometimes we negotiate. Larry surprised me during a visit to my pulmonary clinic. And I'll just tell you quickly about Larry's story. He was about 75 years old and had severe emphysema, or you can call it COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it had been worsening over time. And he was telling me that uh, his quality of life had been suffering. He really didn't want to move. Uh, he was out on one of the islands in Puget Sound. He didn't want to move into Seattle. Uh, didn't want to live with his sons. Uh, didn't want a housekeeper. But um, he was having recurrent hospitalizations. And during these flare-ups of his disease, he, he basically couldn't breathe. He was gasping, and turning blue. He was now on oxygen and prednisone and the various inhalers, but, but still just barely getting by. So one day in the clinic, he said, hey doc, I wanna take you out to lunch. And he was kind of a super salesman kind of guy. I was a little nervous about lunch because I was afraid he was gonna try to sell me something. And in a way he was, he was, trying to sell me about the way he wanted to die. It was very, very straightforward. He said, hey doc, listen, I want help at the end. I'm, I'm just suffering so much, I feel like a fish out of water, I can't breathe, and it's absolutely terrifying. So we talked about that for a while, I tried to clarify his feelings, tried to figure out if he might be depressed, but he was really, pretty straightforward and just said, no, I'm not depressed, I'm just mad as hell. So I said, well, you know, at the end, Larry, the, the best drug is morphine. He said, well, what does that do? And I said, well, it, it makes me comfortable, it, uh, it'll make you comfortable, it'll sedate you, it'll give you a sense of euphoria, takes away your shortness of breath and, and makes you quite peaceful. And he said, well, that's what I want. And I said, there's a downside to morphine because it can speed up, it can hasten your death by a matter of hours or even days. He said, that's not what's important. I just don't want to suffer at the end. So we talked about this more and made a tentative agreement. I asked him to talk to his sons, lived in Seattle, and he did. And we got uh, back on the phone a few weeks later. Uh, and then things were pretty stable for a few months. But then about two weeks before Christmas that year, I got a phone call from the emergency room saying Larry was there. He was in terrible shape. Uh, they wanted to put him in the intensive care unit. And I said, well, I'm not sure that he really wants to go there. Let me come in and see him. So when I saw him in ER, he, he really did look very bad. He was gasping. He was turning blue. 
the treatments weren't working very well. And he looked me in the eye and he said, remember what we talked about? So I reviewed the plan with him and did not admit him to the intensive care unit. That would be the gut reaction in the medical system. If there's technology there, you know, let's use it. Well, he had directed us otherwise, and I was willing to follow that plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we did put him in the, uh, on, the, on the medical unit, and there were two senior nurses that fortunately were very comfortable with this plan. And uh, they said, Dr. Domain, thank goodness you don't think that everybody ought to have CPR at the end, that you're willing to treat him like this. We've done CPR on far too many people at the end. That's cardiopulmonary resuscitation where you really try to do everything. So anyway, we, we went ahead uh, and the nurses started an IV uh, and began to give him a small doses of morphine and just titrated his symptoms. and. He he died peacefully that night, uh, and uh, the sons later wrote me a very nice letter uh, saying that if uh, dad could, he would come back and shake your hand, uh, that he's at peace. And this kind of case, and I go through this frequently in the books, brings up the ethics of what's appropriate in a situation. There's a thing in ethics, uh, particularly at end of life, when you're possibly hastening death, uh, it's called the double effect, and it's based on what the intent is. In this situation with Larry, the intent was to relieve his suffering, not to uh, uh, put him under or put him out medically uh, like we would uh, perhaps with uh, death with dignity law. Although death with dignity law does not apply in a situation where you have to give intravenous medications. So anyway, this is acceptable in medical specialties. A uh, few colleagues would be reluctant to do that. So I, I think it's finding the physician that is, is willing uh, to follow your plan. So I'll read on a little bit um, with uh, a little bit of summary of what this book is about. In this book, I present my own stories, lessons learned from patients like Larry, and many others who taught me about dying. My medical career uh, my medical career began in an era when little could be done for two of our greatest killers, heart disease and cancer. When I started, there were no ventilators. I often saw patients die without the benefit of hospice care. ICUs and CCUs have not, had not yet evolved. But with amazing rapidity, med medical sciences brought us life-saving advances such as hemodialysis, and organ transplants. This progress is both marvelous and problematic. This technology continually outpaces our ability to thoughtfully and ethically bring it to the bedside. When should life prolonging advances be used? How do we decide how to allocate these tools when resources are scarce or, pro or prohibitively expensive? My stories are about hopes and fears common to us all. They are about ethical dilemmas I've encountered and moments they have humbled me. They address advanced care planning, medical aid in dying, conflicts, medical mistakes, modern hospice and palliative care, and touch on spiritual um, aspects of end of life care. They can be read in the order presented or topically. In the last section, I share my thoughts on resilience and leaving a legacy to our loved ones. And what I'd like to do. Greg, it's kind of up to you. I have one uh, short vignette I can read, or we can. Yeah, please. Defer. Yeah, I think that that would be great. And I just will remind people to uh, weigh in with your questions. There's a little button on the lower right side that says "Ask a Question." Uh, I, I encourage you to ask questions. Jim, go ahead. Okay, uh, this one is entitled "My Husband Didn't Want This." How he was voted an outstanding teacher by the pediatric residents year after year. He was a walking textbook of the classic diseases of childhood, measles, mumps, and whooping cough. Over lunch, he'd regale against the way allergists tested kids. Can you believe they tied them to a papoose board and checked all these allergens up and down their back? 
then they put them on these poor kids on dust and mold shots, and there's no proven effectiveness. Howie loved the science of medicine, but his greatest passion was his patients. He had amazing rapport with children. One mom reported that Howie would all but ignore her in favor of hopping up to an exam table to blow up a balloon and start talking with her six-year-old. Kids loved to go see Dr. Howie. He retired about 10 years ahead of me and we lost touch. Then one day I got a call from Howie's wife, Jeannie. He'd had a severe stroke and was in a nursing home. I don't know what to do and I really need some help, Jeannie said. Howie keeps getting pneumonia. He's confused and can't move his right side. Could you visit him? I asked Jeannie how she was holding up. Not very well, she said. I feel so badly for him. They put in his, this feeding tube, which I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have wanted. One thing just led to another during rehab, and he's not making any progress. We chatted some more. As his spouse, Jeannie, was Howie's, Howie's advocate by default, now that he wasn't able to make wish, his wishes known. And unfortunately, he had not completed an advanced directive. Nursing homes are often called God's waiting room. And in a way, that's accurate. Many residents exist in a sort of limbo state, out of sight and out of mind. When I went to visit Howie, he lay propped up in a bed, his bed, his jaw slack, his right eye partially closed. He did not respond to my voice or hand squeeze. The nurses had been able to rouse him. There wasn't much for physical therapy to do other than passive range of motion exercises. I spoke with Howie's neurologist. The prognosis for meaningful recovery looked bleak. Again, Jenny said, I know he would hate being like this, but I'd feel so guilty if I had his tube feeding stopped. I don't even know if the facility would allow that. We found a quiet place to talk. Howie and Jeannie's two sons joined us. Fortunately, all three were in agreement. Howie would never have wanted to live like this. Together, they developed a picture of what he would wish for, what he would say if he could, and how he would love them for listening. They talked with their minister, a close friend, a social worker, and their doctor. A week later, after the feeding tube had been removed, Howie died peacefully. So that's, there's always more that I can read, Greg, but. Uh, that's very good. Maybe we should go on with some questions and, and uh, begin to see what people are interested in hearing about. Yeah, well, that that was good. Thank you for uh, for reading that. Very interesting, and it must raise uh, a lot of questions and comments and observations from uh, from the audience. But let me um, let me ask you a few as as people are contemplating uh, that. Um, I, I'm curious. the The book has been out uh, for a few weeks. What's been the reaction so far? Um, very positive. You know, I my I, two neurosurgeons that have commented uh, positively. And uh, I was a little nervous uh, because I know they can be quite critical and, and uh, quite scientifically oriented. Uh, but, but one of them uh, really enjoyed the ethics of the book. Uh, he's he's a, a guy that's looking at the enlightenment period and he um, felt that the outlining of the conflicting ethics was, was really important. Another uh, person who read it said, I'm 84 and now I realize I better get my advanced directives in order. Um, others uh, simply like the stories. Uh, I've not really had any negative comments yet. I'm sure they're, they're out there, but um, it's, it's, it's a book of stories very much like the one I read. I know when you and I first started talking about this book, you had a fairly broad set of readers in mind, uh, not just the 84-year-old, but the, the whole family. Tell me, who who is the audience for this? Who, who do you think should read it? Well, I think anybody could read it. In fact, I had a friend that sent it to his son, and his son got all worried because he thought they were trying to send him a message. But uh, I, I think... The, the baby boomer generation is particularly important, although I've had people as old as 90 years old read it and felt they got a lot out of it. But I think people that um, are experiencing or may experience the death in the family, like an aging parent, um, or themselves. I, I had one uh, friend that commented to me that she sent this book to a woman who was dying with cancer. 
and the, the women read it and found it uplifting, which surprised me a little bit. I'm not, it's not a book written particularly for dying people because some of the stories uh, aren't pleasant in terms of their outcome. Uh, but I, I, I was hoping to get, my goal is to get people to begin to have a conversation, uh, to begin thinking, and then um, beyond just having a conversation to find an advocate, to find what well, in legal terms we could call the durable power of attorney for healthcare, mm. because that's the critical thing that the person I would turn to at the bedside when we were having a conflicting situation. What, what would you want? Uh, would you want, um, if your mom could tell us, what do you think she would say? And that person, you know, in our last two weeks of life, uh, half of us can't participate in that decision making. So that needs to be done ahead of time for sure. Uh, what do you hope people take away from this? If you were able to sort of boil it down to one or two really key takeaways, what's what are you really trying to, I, you, you, my sense is you sort of have a mission uh, around this. What is that mission? Well, when I, one of them is when I was in intensive care unit, two people had never done enough thinking about that and made plans for themselves. So I, I suppose that there's a very broad outline is to, to, to try to help people get started in the thinking process for themselves. But then, as I mentioned, uh, uh, choosing an advocate and then having discussions with their family. You know, these discussions used to take place around the dinner table. Uh, and there's a project that Michael had from the University of Washington. He now has a website called Round Glass. Um, and he's, he started a whole, it, actually an international movement of called Death Over Dinner, or Let's Have Dinner and Talk About Death, where people would actually, in, a, in kind of a meetup, but somewhat formalized way, uh, have an elegant dinner and then talk about what their own mortality means to them. So I think if I had one goal, it's to get people to talk. The, the next goal would be, please find an advocate and uh, look at not just death, but what are your values and, and try to write those out. Some kind of value statement about what makes life worth living for you. Because we're all different. We all have a different set of values. For some people, their goals are, can be quite varied. For, for example, uh, Katie Hafner from New York Times is writing an article about um, what, what people, goal were around voting and she was able to locate and write about people that just wanted to stay alive long enough to vote in this last election on both sides actually so there i think in, in terms of my, my overall hope was make it light enough reading so so people would read it but also see that technology often can be a double-edged sword. It can be wonderful and heroic and life-saving. But as we age and our quality of life kind of deteriorates, we become more frail. Then we need to have ways of making our wishes known that we don't want certain interventions. And, uh, you know, as you get toward the end, there's real, really three levels of choice. One is do everything possible to keep me alive, or then to find some kind of selective or limited care. Or for the people on hospice, uh, then you, you look at comfort care and palliative care to, to, to treat your symptoms. And so I get people thinking about that in a broad way, and hopefully they'll go in and, and uh, talk to their families and ultimately to their medical team and come up with a plan. Yeah, so uh, the questions are starting to come in. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. Uh, Christmas is coming up. You know, throughout all of our lives, that's been a time to, to you know, for meals and and discussion. That will be perhaps more difficult uh, uh, at this time. Uh, but as people uh, move into the holidays and begin to talk about this, what is the first step that they can take? So they read the book, they set it down. Uh, what's the first step? Well, I, I think 
if some people can do this, they have a wide open family discussion and discuss anything. Others, it, it's the D word, you know, you don't talk about it. Um, and But if they do want to talk about it, they, probably the best website to go to is one by Ellen Goodman. She's got one called the Conversation Project. So if you just Google a conversation project, she has a lot of ideas how to break ice in family conversations. There's even little card games that you can play where you draw a card and have to talk about it. Um, but uh, the, the holidays are, are always a, a tough time and I think they're gonna be even more difficult this year. People are be communicating remotely, but I would start I think with the conversation project and they have videos, uh, lots of ideas. And one thing I found it was useful for people to do, you know, everybody knows somebody that has died. Uh, it's either grandma or somebody else. And they may have feelings about how they died. And, and sometimes rather than talking about your own family, it's either easier to talk about Mrs. Jones down the street, how those medics arrived and, did CPR and gosh, she was 90 years old, which she really wanted that. Those kinds of conversations can get people uh, to, to kind of depersonalize it away and then and then try to bring it back. Um, but but it's a it's I th I think in our society we're more willing to talk about it than we were, but we're we're still not all the way there yet for sure. Let me go to some of the questions. Uh, the first is from Laura B. Uh, and she writes, I, I bought your book during the weekend and I've just started reading. I was impressed by what you said about your mentor, Dr. Francis Wood. Could you expound a little more on the philosophy that Dr. Wood practiced uh, uh, and you as well regarding the treatment of patients uh, being human rather than case studies? Yeah, I, I, it's one of those moments in school when you just remember what a professor did or said. And he, he really humanized the encounter. And I, I never forgot it, that this is a person that's coming to see you and they're playing, pay, playing uh, paying incredible trust in your care. And uh, we, we tend to sometimes develop internal lingo that is not respectful. Uh, and actually, uh, a doctor from the University of Washington just published an article about that, trying to, in a sense, rehumanize uh, the patient uh, care, and I, I think we're getting better at that, but, but we still still have a ways to go. But yeah, he, he was a, a real mentor. He would walk around the wards with us, and just the way he would approach the bedside, uh, he would touch the patient. We've almost forgotten how to lay on hands uh, during an exam, but he would hold their hand. He would use his stethoscope. And, and there's a real power of touch. There's an author, Abraham Verges, that wrote a wonderful novel, Cutting for Stone, but he's a professor at Stanford and he, he has a wonderful TED talk on the power of touch. And uh, we, we tend to neglect that. You know, in the annual Medicare exam, now it's kind of a checkbox medicine. Um, but uh, I, I always relieve when a doctor says, you know, take off your shirt, I want to examine you. So. I, I personally feel better when that happens. This question and your answer makes me think of something I've always wanted to ask a doctor, which is, um, how do you how do you have the connection without becoming so uh, you know wrapped up in in the the family's concerns or the patient's concerns? Is is that difficult? It. It takes a certain way uh, that I, I think a lot of professions probably have to have, whether you're a fireman or a policeman or whatever, that you've got to be able to somewhat be able to leave work at work. Um, but um, I, I think in the real intensive specialties like emergency room or critical care, there, there tends to be a burnout. and. Um, you know, when I practiced, I, I saw intensive care physicians burning out because there's just too much emotional overload. There's too much crisis. There's families in crisis. There's patients who get angry at you. There's all kinds of dysfunctional behavior. So there's got to be a way of segregating that. I, I think uh, in a small town, you can't escape that uh, because uh, 
you're, you're going to be playing bridge with your doctor. Uh, my, that was one of my sister's situations. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different relationship in, from a small town to a big city hospital, depending on where you are. You, you mentioned burnout, and uh, this next question uh, is interesting because it relates to that. You know, with COVID, we're all reading and hearing about uh, you know frontline workers uh, who are burning out because of uh, just the, the, sh the sheer volume and numbers. This question is: uh, What are you learning about people who are currently either dying of COVID uh, or who, ha who have loved ones who are dying of COVID? This seems such a whole new situation for us in facing death without being together as it happens. Yeah, this is a very, very difficult situation. I attended uh, virtually the local uh, critical care conferences here and COVID updates uh, from intensive care. And it's, it's hard on the medical teams and it's, it's very hard on the patient and family, particularly family members, because they're generally excluded from being in a room of somebody that gets admitted to the hospital. If they can be cared for at home, they, that's that's one thing. But in in the hospital is particularly the initial wave that came in on the east side. Uh, people were, were really scrambling and it, it became more and more difficult. In some countries like Italy, they were just absolutely overwhelmed and, and didn't even admit patients. And, you know, that's really an emotional crisis when you just send somebody home to die. I got a call from a, a black friend who uh, deals with end of life issues and she was very upset in her community, the disproportionate rates of, of COVID infections uh, in the uh, black community and other minority community as well. And, but the, the, there is this isolation, there's some attempts to communicate using iPads and things like that. But again, the lack of touch, the lack of being able to hold their hand. And they are making some exceptions now at the end of uh, somebody's really dying of allowing a family member to come in. Um, but I, I, there's, there's just no ideal here. And it's one of the um, situations why that we'll probably have to live with to a certain degree. And I, I worry a lot about the current uh, rising cases in Western Washington for right in the middle of another upswing in the pandemic. Art asks the following question. Uh, I live in Washington, I'm 69, uh, yoga and good health. If I have advanced indications that death is soon, I wanna die in Southeast Utah above Monument Valley. I expect a total lack of getting the timing right. Is there anything that can be done other than hiring an ambulance to help the timing? What can I plan for? Uh, it's a individual actively dying or it's a I think the the question um, uh, I, you know I expect to, uh, is there anything that can be done other than hiring an ambulance um, I, I think the question has to do with those those final moments perhaps if you're uh, or the final the final days if you're alone uh, yeah. what what are your options yeah options, I, I suppose would be one yeah the well there are air medevac uh, possibilities but it's horrendously expensive um, with a private plane uh, to air back here I mean they, these are done internationally and um, where you take out rows of seats and have an attendant with you and that kind of thing but um, it would be best, obviously, to, to, to try to get somewhere, maybe under medical advice, um, be, before the crisis occurs. It's really hard to move people once, once a crisis is occurring. I even had a patient that came in one time, and I think it's in a book, that, that he did not want to die at home. He, he, he was just terrified of dying at home. He wanted to be in an inpatient hospice unit. And he had, he had advanced cancer and he, he liked his hospice care at home, but he just didn't want to die there. So he uh, made a deal that they would get him into the hospice unit. But he, even though it was probably just a few miles away, he was still not sure in his own mind that he was going to make it. So 
there's just one of these unknowns, I think. Great. The next question is from uh, Amy Miller. Have you heard of the Serious Illness Conversation Project uh, that was born from the great mind of Atul Gawande? Uh, it's an amazing tool to help understand what is important to those who are facing serious illness. Yeah, of course, Atul Gawande is kind of my, my hero. He's <laughs> written some wonderful books. Uh, Being Mortal is probably top on my list. And, and I listed in my book is the you have one go-to book, that would be it. Yeah, he, the, th the things that he outlines are, are right on and I, I think worth looking at. Um, th there's even a, 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 in the website, uh, I think it's either Prepare for Your Care or The Conversation Project. They have the top 10 books and websites uh, for uh, death and dying. There's a lot of books, a lot of efforts to assist people now. This didn't even exist when I was in medical school. Um, we were told not to talk about death. We were, were told not even to tell a patient they had cancer, uh, only whisper it to the family. It was, I was, went through medical school in a, in a time of beneficence where, you know, doctor knows best. But, but now, the, I, th I think we all have that autonomous right to direct our own care, but, Part of that is getting educated, particularly about something like cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, we're all signed up for CPR. I mean, if we fall down in a mall, a stranger is allowed to come up to us, start CPR, bare our chest, and if the AED is available to give us a shock to get our heart going again. Well, you know, when you're 85, do you really want to have that done? And this is where we need to take charge of those kinds of things and, and make it known, certainly with an advocate or if there's some documents or even bracelets or medallions you can get. Um, but if you do have a serious illness, it's really important to know what your options are. And often people that decide to go into hospice, that's one lesson I really wanna leave in the book. If, if you're thinking about hospice, contact them. If you have a serious illness and are maybe have less than six months to, leave, to live, talk to hospice and talk to them early on because they want to get to know you and they can help you and control your symptoms. And ironically, people that do enroll in hospice earlier tend to live longer. There's been some studies about that. So I don't know if this helps, but anything, yeah. Yeah. anything Atul Grandi does is great. Uh, on that, let me just ask a, a follow-up question. What is a, a good death? So you were talking about hospice and, and that might be part of it. Do you, do you have an example or a story of, of what really is a good death? Well, I'll give you a few pointers first. I, I think you know, when Katie Sewell asked me that on KUOW a few years ago, I, I said, well, it's having your, your wishes respected. Uh, having what matters to you the most taken into account so that, that you're really paid attention to. I think most people would say in terms of place, they would want to die at home. Uh, they would want pain and suffering uh, controlled. Uh, they would want to have some kind of attention often to their spiritual state, their emotional state, certainly to their physical state. And, uh, and uh, to have an advocate there strongly uh, respecting their wishes so that they were done. I, I can briefly tell you a story um, that's in the book, but it's, it's about a, a woman that was referred to me for severe shortness of breath. She was probably in her 50s. No, she was in her 60s. Um, but uh, she didn't have the usual things like asthma or, or COPD or any primary uh, lung tissue problem. Her problem turned out to be pulmonary hypertension. The blood vessels in the lungs are generally a low pressure system, but hers for unknown reasons had, had uh, developed very high pressure. And so the heart could no longer pump blood effectively through the lungs and she was going into heart failure. So we, 
she she came in. She's a very sweet lady, a very kind of low key. Always had a little smile on her face. Um, she would always bring me a little gift or present, and we uh, struck up a really nice relationship. And uh, and she was worsening, and uh, she was also planning a trip to Guam. She was from Guam originally, and she. Uh, said that she would like me to prescribe oxygen, uh, and I did. I was a little nervous about the trip to Guam, but her husband said this was very important to her. Uh, they had a lot of relatives there, and they knew this would probably be the last trip. So they did go to Guam. Uh, she had oxygen over there and sent me a postcard saying she was kind of doing okay. But when she got back, she was really worse. And I, um, I, I asked her husband to come in and talk to both of them because I thought she was at a point where she would benefit from a lung transplant. Uh, she would actually have been a pretty good candidate for that. But she said, oh, no, I would never want anything like that. She and her husband, Gerald, had talked about that. And she said, you know, it's, if whatever God's will, I will follow. Um, I, I'm just too afraid of doing something like that. So she demurred. I was ready to fight on. But she taught me that I needed to accept what was important to her as a patient. So as she worsened, she was transitioned to hospice. And I did not see her in the office again. I would get periodic notes from hospice. And there was a hospice physician that was following her. But one day I got a call uh, from uh, the hospice nurse saying that she would really like to see me uh, at home if I could come visit. So I said, OK. and I left the office at about 6 p.m. and drove to her home. It was a nice suburban home in the Bellevue area and knocked on the door. And I, I could hear some music coming from inside. It was kind of, to me, a little bit strange. But a grandchild answered the door and called for her, his grandpa. And they invited me in. And there was music playing. And there were a lot of kids running around the room. And there was food all over the table, just uh, uh, bounding. Uh, and uh, there was her bed in the living room, her head propped up. Uh, she had a little IV in her arm uh, where she was getting small doses of morphine uh, to keep her comfortable. And she just smiled at me and said, doctor, why don't you go get something to eat? <laughs> so she was kind of taking care of me. And uh, I sat with her for a while, listened to her chest with my stethoscope. And again, that's kind of the laying out of hands that I talked about, part of the art of medicine. And uh, so we, we just had a nice chat and uh, we, we parted. Uh, and uh, she, she just, uh, she was Catholic and just had this outlook of uh, not fatalism, but just acceptance of what life was giving her. And the family was so supportive. And so to me, that that's a good death. And a, what I call in the book, a healing death. It's healing for the family, healing for her, and also healing for me. Right, oh, that's a great story. I wonder if I'm going to get feedback. Uh, let me go to a, qu a question from Pat. This is uh, interesting. I follow your blog and love it. Thank you for writing your book. Can you walk through the words to ask someone to be your advocate? Uh, my family lives in another state. For recent surgery, I'd asked a dear friend when they picked me up to go to the hospital. They told me they would not be able to continue as my advocate. Surgical team was great. So what? how do you recruit an advocate? Well, quite often it's a family member. You know, if you're married, it's a spouse. Uh, sometimes it's uh, adult children. Um, I've had people though that tell me um, there's nobody, there's nobody they can trust. And, and that's a difficult situation. There is a, an organization in, based in Seattle, but I'm sure it's statewide. It's called the Washington State Health Advocacy Association. Um, Robin Shapiro is the executive director of that. And, and uh, they, they do, it's not a pro bono type thing, but they do have advocates that you can bring on and, and uh, even make doctor's visits with you and that kind of thing. I'm hopeful that there will, hopefully in the future, there'll be more of a volunteer service where people 
uh, can volunteer to, to be advocates, but it, it is quite a job. It means a deep conversation, understanding what the values of the individual are and, and then helping out. And uh, so this advocate legally would be called the durable power of attorney for health care. Mm. Under Washington state law, it's it's the spouse. If you have if you don't have papers filled out otherwise, um, you can choose anybody as an advocate. But if you don't have one under law, it would be your spouse. And if not your adult children, the problem there is all the adult children have to agree. And that makes it difficult sometimes because there's always, you know, one kid that lives in Alaska that's going to disagree and and throw a monkey wrench into the works. Um, but, or another uh, state. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it's not easy to find the right advocate. It's got to be somebody close to your heart, uh, somebody that uh, almost like an executive, somebody that can take charge, somebody that can stand up to the doctors, uh, to maybe other family members, and really uh, say what you would want. And, and that's that's not an easy job. I don't take that lightly. And I admire the people that can do it well. I had one fellow, uh, it's actually a physician dying from emphysema, and I was out of town, and my, he did not want to ever go on a ventilator. And my colleague, while I was gone, uh, the doctor got admitted with his bad emphysema. My colleague said, I want to move you to the ICU. And his wife said, first of all, the patient said, no, I don't want to go there. And the, the guys kept, my colleague kept pounding them a little bit and said, well, you, I think you should, you need to rethink that. And uh, finally, the wife basically threw my colleague out of the room. <laughs> so sometimes it, it takes a real confrontation uh, and that advocate has to be pretty strong. Uh, we've only got a few minutes remaining. Let me, there's another question here from, um, uh, from Amy Miller. I'm a palliative uh, care nurse practitioner and appreciate all the attention you and others bring to this topic. It takes a special person to do what you do. Any particular guidance you can give to a practitioner dealing with these types of issues day in and out or anything you wish you would have done differently during the time in the ICU? Well, I think it's important to, to have time away uh, both mentally and physically, because otherwise uh, there is burnout. And, and as mentioned in the COVID epidemic, they're seeing that there's a shortage of trained staff. Um, I decided to, to go into a, a, a kind of practice where I did have time away. I could spend time with my family, take vacations. Um, to, to me, my own background, having liberal arts education, with some philosophy and religion and humanities, uh, I think helped me with balance. I, I think the secret is is finding a balance. The, there's an old saying that the the, uh, the the patient's meat is the doctor's poison. So you know, if it can be very needy, it can be uh, to the point where it caused mental breakdown. I've got one of my medical students in my class. Mm -hmm decided he was going to see every patient in the hospital, uh, every every new admission, and he, he burned out and went into a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. So finding finding that balance, talking to your loved ones, talking to people that are around you so that you don't get caught in that maelstrom um, that, that can really happen. And I think that happens in other service professions as well. Uh, we talked about this question ahead of time. It's, um, I think this would be helpful as we get down to the last few minutes. Um, how is death handled for persons with dementia? You know, that's uh, um, more and more uh, being being addressed. There's a doctor at the University of Washington, Barack Gassner. In fact, uh, he's done a review of my book for me. Uh, he he uh, has developed a dementia directive, and if you simply Google a dementia directive, you'll find it. Uh, it basically has to be filled out before you get dementia to say what kind of care you would want. And early dementia, moderate dementia, or severe dementia, there's kind of three levels where they talk about the level of care you would want. Um, 
the dementia patients um, would not, once you're in dementia, you would not qualify for death with dignity uh, because you don't have um, the mental capacity to do so under Washington state law. Um, the, uh, there are things about dementia care that um, are, there, there's some, a lot of discussion about feeding in dementia, let's say very, very, very advanced dementia, whether if somebody isn't requesting food or doesn't appear hungry, are you still gonna offer them food uh, when they're you know, in that very advanced state of dementia? Um, so sometimes we're applying technology to dementia patients that maybe we shouldn't. Uh, very briefly, I'll tell you a, a story from the book about a, a lady with advanced dementia kept getting readmitted to the hospital because she had bone marrow failure and needed transfusions every couple of weeks. And <clears throat> she was brought in one time when I was on call and, and promised she'd get to the emergency room, they'd have to stick her with a needle and give her blood and she would go berserk and have to be sedated and they get admitted to the hospital. And it's happened over and over again, even though she had a very advanced dementia and hadn't recognized her family in years. And uh, I had family conference with them uh, and uh, we were making progress uh, on the option of maybe no more transfusions when the husband got up and stomped out and said, this is like Dachau. And uh, so it kind of shut down the, the uh, discussion, but I offered to meet with him the next day. And it turns out that he was having early dementia himself. Uh, so I was talking a little bit about blood transfusions and I said, you know, these might actually be harming her because one of the physician's duties is to do no, no harm. And he says, you know, you're right. And I said, why do you think I'm right? He said, well, she might get AIDS, which was the farthest thing from my mind, you know. Uh, but that, that's a story I call ethics on thin ice. Uh, so we, they, he did agree though, and the family agreed. We stopped the transfusions, she died peacefully. But in, in some units, you know, the dementia patients still get way too much um, technology to try to keep them alive. And it is going to be such a dilemma until we find some kind of prevention or, or, or drug or some kind of system that helps with dementia from occurring in the first place. Well, Jim, this has been great. I think the questions have been terrific. We're, we're running out of time. Is there any final word that you would like to to have before we turn it back over to Claire? Well, I, I'd love to hear from people. Um, actually, if you look at my blog, it's just endoflifeblog.com. You can make comments there. Uh, I, I just love to get the feedback because uh, I've been hoping not just with my blog and giving talks in public the way I do, but hoping the book even gets a wider net, um, which I, I hope helps people in their lives. Uh, and I just want to wrap up, uh, Claire, by thanking uh, Village Books. I know you're in two locations there, Linden and, and Bellingham, and uh, encourage people. Uh, there's a button there to, to purchase the, the book or drop by uh, your books. Or actually, I don't know if you are, are you open for drop bys or? We are open. We are um, following all of the uh, sort of the protocol uh, masks and cleanings and capacity regulation. But yes, we are open. We do curbside service too. Um, and of course, online ordering. So um, yeah. we are back to full service with some, like I say, some capacity. We, we're yeah. not letting the, the normal numbers in the store that we normally do. But um, did I did I get that right in the chat? Endoflife.com, is that the correct? I put that in yes, the chat. Yes, that looks right, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to, I just want to thank both of you so much for, um, for this great conversation. It was very informative and, um, inspiring for those of us, as you said, who may not like to sometimes say the D word with our families. Um, and so I, I appreciate you both being here. I appreciate um, those of you who are watching in the audience. Um, and if anyone is watching this recorded on YouTube, uh, the link to our website is below in the description. Um, so you can check out Village Books that way too. But I do want to thank you both, uh, Greg and Jim.
Um, thank this you was, so much, and thanks this was a delight. For, for having me. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I think we say good night. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.